Welcome, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Kubiak. I'm a professor of practice uh, at ASU here, where I serve as the director of future security education in ASU's Future Security Initiative. The educational offerings I help guide include the MA in Global Security, which is a non-technical con with uh, it, which has a non-technical concentration in cybersecurity and a soon-to-launch concentration in irregular warfare. We also offer a graduate certificate in global security and competitive statecraft and are building a new portfolio of short courses and similar topics to be offered at ASU's career and professional development educational outlet called Career Catalyst. Tonight's event is one in a series of events we run each fall and spring semesters to highlight the thought leading security practitioner faculty that teach in our programs. Our guest tonight is one of our newest additions to the MAGS faculty, Professor of Practice Ken Gleiman. Dr. Gleiman is a 27-year veteran of the United States Army and is a retired colonel. He is a Green Beret and Army strategist and currently serves as the president of the Army Strategist Association. His assignments while active duty included a panelist on the DOD China Task Force, an advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy Plans and Capabilities, Director of Strategy Plans and Assessments for the U.S. Security Coordinator to Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and Director, U.S. Pacific Commanders Action Group, uh, and Director of Plans for Special Operations Co Component Command in Afghanistan. Early in his career, Ken also served with the 1st uh, Special Forces Group Airborne and the 75th Ranger Regiment. His overseas tours included combat and operational assignments to Israel, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Philippines, as well as other assignments to Japan, Australia, and Korea. He has a bunch of master's degrees and a PhD in security studies from Kansas State University. The topic tonight is irregular warfare. Uh, it is the topic of the upcoming book by Ken and some of his other colleagues titled Winning the Peace, Irregular Warfare and Strategic Competition. Ken's gonna talk for about 20 or 25 minutes or so and then we'll open it up for questions. But please feel free at any time to type questions into the Q&A block uh, and we'll try to get them answered. All right, without further ado, Ken, appreciate your time. Uh, we look forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, I am going to uh, share my uh, slides here. So hopefully this will come up and you'll be able to see it here shortly with a little me here in the, uh, in the, uh, in the bottom uh, right of the screen. So uh, uh, thanks for that wonderful introduction, Jeff. And I'm really pleased to have this, uh, this uh, quick presentation and then hopefully longer conversation with, uh, with this group. Um, and we are uh, talking about uh, a forthcoming book called Winning the Peace, Irregular Warfare and Competitive Statecraft. And yes, Jeff, you did not get it wrong. Uh, the, the title has been shifting between whether to use this term competitive statecraft or strategic competition. But right now, the working title is Winning the Peace, Irregular Warfare and Competitive Statecraft. And it's expected to come out uh, at the Cambria Press in uh, hopefully early 2024, depending on how much we argue with editors and peer reviewers. Um, I'm going to give about, there's about uh, eight or nine slides here. I'm just going to talk through um, a, a bit of the book to sort of set the conversation. And then I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, yourself in the audience with uh, uh, with questions and conversation and uh, who knows, maybe help us uh, improve this, uh, uh, th this book project, which has been a labor of love for myself and for other authors. Um, I'll talk briefly about the authors and the audience, and in that part, I'll just give you a little story behind the book and why we decided to write it and uh, joined up with Cambria to do this project. I'll try to go over the thesis and sort of the key points. Uh, I'll show you the organization of the chapters. I'll talk a little bit about the conclusions and recommendations because those are always fun and hard, and then I hope to uh, dive into some discussion. Um, okay, so, uh, so first of all, uh, authors and audience. So, this book project is a labor of love of four friends uh, at Georgetown University, uh, where I, I still teach as an adjunct, but uh, was spending a lot more time as an adjunct there uh, prior to joining the team here at Arizona State University. And the four of us uh, are all, oddly enough, former Army strategists, which um, is, some of you may know, in the Army, there is actually a career field called strategist, where you work on strategy and operational plans, institutional strategy, etc. But we were all four of us teaching a, uh, a course on strategy, policy, and military operations, which uh, evolved on numerous course reviews into conversations about strategic competition. Um, I'll begin with uh, Rebecca Patterson, our actual, our, our lead author. 
Uh, she's actually the director of the security studies program at uh, Georgetown, which is essentially a, a, a very similar uh, equivalent program to the MAGS program here at Arizona State. I would say um, very similar in student body interests and subject matter, um, but she is the associate director of that program. She's also the author of uh, a few books and several articles focused on nation building and economic statecraft. Um, Susan Bryant is another great friend, uh, also an, ad an adjunct professor at Georgetown, but she has done uh, numerous uh, assignments um, in strategy at the highest levels of our government. Um, she, she was the former chief of the Army Strategic Studies Group. She also had some wonderful assignments to the Department of State, working for Richard Armitage and working in the state uh, policy planning. Um, she and Mark uh, Troutman, who's uh, below, actually completed an edited volume uh, a year and a half ago on the National Security Enterprise, um, which is a fantastic edited volume from Cambria Press, uh, which is actually part of the reason why we pitched book to Cambria. Um, it's, it's a wonderful uh, publishing company, and, uh, and you, you can actually check out that book. I'll try to throw a link in here uh, uh, later. Um, and then, of course, uh, Mark Troutman, who is also an adjunct professor in this program. Uh, he's an economist. He's the former dean of the Eisenhower School of the National Defense University and the director of the Center for Infrastructure Protection at George Mason University. So he has done a great deal of work on, uh, on resilience in, uh, uh, in, in, in government, which led to a lot of the discussion on the resilience chapters, which I'll talk a little bit about here briefly. And then of course you have me, I am definitely the weak link of these, uh, of these uh, authors and friends. And uh, I was not only working on this same course on teaching strategy, policy and military operations, but I actually uh, designed a course on irregular warfare and strategic competition at the request of Rebecca Patterson. Part of the reason we did that was during a lot of these reviews we had numerous discussions about the program at Georgetown, which is a fantastic program. It has two core courses that all students have to uh, have to take. One is, um, is you know, is, our strat is uh, 500, SSP 500, which is essentially an international relations course, but focuses on why war and conflict happens. 501, which is this course, uh, Strategy, Policy, and Military, uh, military Operations, is, uh, is a course on strategy. So not necessarily why wars happen, but really how to win wars, how to achieve your objectives, uh, case studies in history, et cetera. Now, if you wanted to, to, to study and understand, well, what about competition or statecraft uh, when, uh, outside of war? outside of the security dilemma, while there's uh, a, a relatively peaceful environment. Well, you can take tons of courses at Georgetown on that or on different aspects of that. But I created that irregular warfare course and strategic competition course to kind of bridge the gap. And I, I designed it uh, with Rebecca's help. And uh, that sort of served initially, I would say, as the framework for this book. But after the input of Susan, Mark, and Rebecca, I think that the students who took that, that course, which I very much enjoy teaching, would read this book and find a lot of the same themes in it, but they would also find it quite different. So um, this was a wonderful process among four friends um, who had miraculously stayed friends, at least I think, they haven't told me otherwise yet, um, it, through this, uh, this process. And, um, and part of this talk, I, I don't just want to talk about, I'll talk about the themes of the book, of course, but also just lend you a little bit uh, of the experience of writing a co-authored book. And I'll say very briefly that a couple things, uh, if you ever have the pleasure of embarking on such a thing that you might want to consider is, uh, is one, uh, you know, uh, definitely pick uh, some good friends uh, that you know you'll stay friends with uh, when you write. I would also recommend that uh, you know you pick a lead author, which we did, and that was a great idea. We gave that role to Rebecca, and uh, she has been great in telling us and adjudicating our arguments over the book um, and saying, 
you know, I've heard you, but we're going to change this for the way we're going to frame this to this. And, you know, sorry, Ken, but you can't write 14,000 words on that one chapter, which is supposed to be 7,000. You're just going to have to get over it. And so, uh, uh, so that's been a, been a pleasurable experience. And I'll also say that uh, we have had the benefit of some fantastic graduate students uh, uh, that have served as graduate assistants and have helped us work on the research, the writing, the framing, and also arguing with us about the book. In some ways, I actually think they should be authors as well, um, but they will certainly be uh, put into the acknowledgments. And I bring that up, that last part, because, well, you know, who's this book for? Well, I'll tell you, it, it's, it, we might debate this a little bit and we think it should have a very broad audience, but there's no doubt in my mind that we have been writing for those graduate students, those new entrants into the national security profession. That's really who we uh, who we've directed it at. And, and that's another reason why I think our graduate assistants have been so helpful in this book as uh, telling us, you know what, sorry, but you have to explain what that means because if you're talking to other professors, they, they know that word, they know that author, but you're gonna have to define this better. Um, so that has been, uh, has been fantastic. Um, so let me get to the thesis and the, uh, and, and the key points of the book. And I, if I could put it in a nutshell, it's very much focused on the United States. And the United States has to master both these concepts of irregular warfare and competitive statecraft, which I'll explain in a bit why those are uh, related, uh, to win in strategic competitions. A lot of these points you'll find you if you're involved in national security and you pay attention to it, you'll say, actually, hey, that's not new. I've heard several authors, uh, especially recently, say something similar. And I would agree with you. And I'll say that we have consolidated some of what we think are the best points in this area and framed it in a way that is different from the ways that you may have seen it framed. Um, the first point being uh, that U.S. national leaders are right now pursuing what we think is a narrowly cast military-centric technology and current-centric strategy instead of the more appropriate whole of society approach that leverages American strength. We are not in any way arguing that uh, military strength is not important, but we we see a DOD centrism that uh, we actually think is is dangerous and could lead to the United States being incredibly strong and still losing the peace. Uh, we think the st strategic competition will most, will most likely fall well short of full-scale war. There's at least two great examples of why that thinking may not be right. Uh, in fact, in the last two years, where we see that world leaders, uh, one from a state and some from a recent non-state uh, non actor have chosen to use military force to achieve objectives. However, we feel in the long run, great power in great power competition, large scale war is less likely. Um, we think that strategic competition will most often be characterized in terms of irregular warfare. Again, something we get into depth on defining. And we think that irregular warfare, the way we choose to define it is broader than currently defined and consists of a lot of tools that actually fall outside the purview of DOD, but because the word ha the uh, the concept has the word warfare in it, it is uh, it has been a DOD centric concept. So irregular warfare, we choose to define it as activities short of conventional and nuclear warfare that are designed to expand a country's and these three words are underlined for a reason: power, influence, and legitimacy as well as weaken its adversaries. We are taking a really broad definition of the term, and I'll show you a couple of other definitions. Um, and if you read the book, or should you get the chance to read the book, you, you'll see we spend a significant amount of time in each chapter and in the introduction in framing and getting after definitions of some of these key terms, because, well, quite frankly, in the literature, they're used differently and sometimes used in a very sloppy manner by, uh, by practitioners. But power, influence, and legitimacy, super important. And then we define the categorical tools of IW and uh, the tools of statecraft as military, economic, information, and resilience to adversary IW. You'll notice military, economic, and information. And immediately some uh, people, including our editors, have asked the question, well, what about diplomatic? What about dime fill? 
uh, whatever you put about it. Well, you see in the book that diplomatic is very important and it's actually highlighted in everything because one of the things that we are advocating, I guess advocating is the right word, that we're pointing out, I think, is the centrality of the diplomatic, diplomatic element of national power or diplomacy in general. And we are lumping in, I think, mainly because of length of the book, um, financial intelligence and legal uh, aspects into these three uh, into these three concepts of statecraft. So let me jump ahead here, and I'll, and I'll, I'll just uh, talk briefly about the definition of irregular warfare. I'll go over some more points, and then we'll we'll, we'll look at the the chapter construction. So, irregular warfare has been one of the most painfully misdefined, redefined, and argued over terms, especially in those that run in national security and DOD circles. Uh, it's gotten to the point over the last few years where it's a bit of navel gazing going on uh, in just talking about the term. Just this year, while we were writing book, the Department of Defense decided it would redefine the term in a way that kind of caught a lot of us by surprise. But they called it a form of warfare where states and non-state actors, that's important, campaign, because they love that word campaign, to assure or coerce states or other groups, which I assume means non-state actors, through indirect non-attributable asymmetric activities. A bit of a complicated definition, but you'll notice their previous definition was a violent struggle among state and non-state actors for, and oh yes, they had these wonderful terms, legitimacy and influence over relevant populations. I can't tell you why they removed the terms legitimacy and influence, they should put them back. Um, I can tell you why they chose warfare because they're DOD and they were very afraid of taking out either the violence or the warfare from the definition. Um, it had to somehow be a part of the definition. Well, over on the right, uh, you have a, a diagram there that I, um, I stole from the great Tom Marks and uh, David Uko, uh, two friends and colleagues who are actually about to tear up my book because I think they're, they're on the review team. But this was how irregular warfare was generally conceived in sort of the academic practitioner community. Those like myself who went to the School of Advanced Military Studies, where I met the wonderful Jeff Kubiak. Um, this was kind of how we conceived of it. If you looked at the, you know, we have, I'm an Army strategist, so I have to have Clausewitz on the front somewhere, I suppose. But if you look at how Clausewitz conceived his secondary trinity, we would say that conventional or traditional warfare is usually involved with efforts to defeat a military in order to compel a government to do our will. It dealt with compellence. It dealt with the use of military on military force, and that is conventional or traditional warfare, where irregular warfare was different. It was about chain lines, the population changing their view and their understanding of the legitimacy of the government in order to compel the government to either to change what it was doing. And that was the general conception. So really, irregular warfare and traditional warfare had similar ends, but they were actually focused in different areas. That's the way I learned it. Um, I'm not sure why DOD kind of changed it, but that's part of the argument that we have. So we came up with this better definition, and I'd like to say we came up with it on our own. But no, like much in the book, we borrow it from what we thought was the best, and we try to explain why it's the best. And this definition of uh, irregular warfare actually comes from Seth Jones, um, slightly modified. And then we also have this, this, this wonderful argument that says, well, if so much of irregular warfare doesn't involve the Department of Defense, doesn't involve coercion, it doesn't involve violence, can it really be warfare? You should take that out of it. Well, a number of people uh, use this term competitive statecraft. I actually attribute it, and I think the best definition, the definition we stole, or well, of course, we attribute it to him, actually comes from Ryan Shaw, who is an ASU uh, professor of practice, but, uh, but that's how we define it. So you can almost use these terms interchangeably. Uh, we think they are highly related, and we decided to, to use them both. So going back to the thesis and, and key points, I'll run through these fairly quickly, and I'll open them up for discussion because I would love to hear what you have to think. But the greatest threats to the uh, United States international order are not necessarily military. There are absolutely very serious military uh, and nuclear threats, but in the long run, our concern as we as we as we examine this in class and in conversation and in our readings, 
We think there's a high risk of the U.S. winning sort of the military deterrence fight, having the strongest military gaining all their power, but losing influence and legitimacy. Um, modern war is too costly and therefore less likely. U.S. competitors, uh, irregular warfare has actually eroded U.S. influence and legitimacy. And the U.S. has done some of this to itself. Some of these are self are, are uh, unforced errors, if you will. We take an examination of American strategic culture and contrast that with the strategic culture of our competitors. Now, I know what uh, some of you may be thinking. If you spend any time in the international relations or in the national security community, you might cringe a little bit at the idea of strategic culture. It's a very hotly debated topic, I would say. Some feeling that strategic culture is a really bad independent variable, but I will tell you that we didn't arrive at this uh, easily. But when you want to contrast the way the United States approaches national security, and you want to contrast that with competitors, you will end up diving deep into the literature of strategic culture. So we just kind of held our noses and jumped right in. Um, we emphasize that U.S. strategic culture, along with a lot of our allies and partners, actually has this dichotomy between war and peace, which we think is a false dichotomy. Um, it's uh, based on geographic isolation and exceptionalism, and U.S. exceptionalism, which you know we introduced. Uh, there's a lot of literature on that. We try to uh, do justice to all of it, but of course, this tendency towards strategic narcissism, where uh, the United States isn't understanding the uh, the strategic culture of of, uh, of competitors. The dichotomy between war and peace, I will tell you that, you know, we bring this up because in our courses, we teach a lot of uh, Eastern strategists, not just Sun Tzu, but we spend a lot of time uh, reading the Artha Shastra of, uh, uh, of the great Indian strategist Katilya in both context, in its original context, but then also in how the Indian subcontinent has kind of adopted it in the last uh, in the last hundred years and how it's affected their strategic culture. Um, and then uh, the last part, I think uh, uh, this is very important, is uh, this is something you'll see throughout the book and all of the chapters. We make sure that we get to a definition of power, influence, and legitimacy. And we do justice to all of the literature on power, whether we're talking about Joseph Nye, Zimmerling, Baldwin, uh, you know, going... Uh, deep back into the literature, but emphasizing that we're choosing a very specific definition of power that is best summarized as the ability to coerce so that it is not confused, as is often the case in international relations literature, with the term influence. They are not the same, at least the way that we're, we choose to define them and we use various points of the literature, but influence is very simply determined as or defined as the ability to convince. And then legitimacy we dive into the, uh, and, and I hope that we do this, we do all three of these justice because the literature and international relations on these three concepts is so deep and so vast, but legitimacy, being the, the socially constructed belief that something is right or proper. We do talk about the levels of legitimacy being domestic legitimacy versus international uh, legitimacy, and both are important in irregular warfare and strategic competition. And then of course, those four sort of key tools of uh, of, of statecraft, which I'm happy to talk more uh, and, and in depth about and what those involve and how we uh, discuss those, measure those, et cetera. But we do do a great emphasis on resilience because getting yourself right first, making your, your own societies, your own institutions and your ability to govern resilient to it, it, both irregular warfare and those unanticipated things that can... Uh, that can, uh, can harm you is uh, probably one of the most important things you can do in irregular warfare uh, to counter adversary irregular warfare. Let me jump on to very quickly to the organization of the book. So, you know, it begins with an introduction, which uh, was one of the hardest things to write because we really had to uh, do justice to those terms that I just walked you through. The second chapter deals with a study of uh, the literature on American strategic culture, focusing on what we think contrasts with our competitor approaches, which is the next chapter. I will tell you the competitor approaches chapter was one of the hardest things to write because of word count. And um, I will tell you when, when we first wrote this chapter, like I said, it was, uh, I think I indicated before, it may have been about twice the length it was supposed to be. 
And that was because it didn't want to just include Russia and China in the contrast. There was, a, you know, we wanted to include other regional competitors, et cetera. But it just couldn't be. So um, trying to do justice also to Russia and Chinese uh, strategic cultures, dealing with the history of the Communist Party, et cetera, in 7,000 words was extremely challenging. And I am anticipating uh, getting some nasty grams when this is published from the various uh, China and Russia experts I've dealt with in my career, because I probably oversimplified their approaches a bit. But um, that's just something you have to uh, get used to um, in, in writing this book. The, the four chapter political warfare in the Cold War provides a case study and a contrast. And one of the interesting points of the book is that our competitors, that US competitors actually believe that the United States are, is, uh, are masters of irregular warfare masters of convincing populations uh, to revolt um, and in their histories and their documents actually give way more credit than the United States uh, uh, it deserves for uh, undermining their governments. When you present this to U.S. strategists and policymakers, they almost laugh because they think there's no way that we deserve that much credit. When you speak to uh, chi uh, China's policymakers and strategists and Russians, they give way more credit than we probably do for our ability to use irregular warfare, uh, especially during the Cold War. Um, the truth is somewhere in between, and that's something I'm happy to happy to talk about. Um, the next uh, three chapters are you know cover those kind of elements of statecraft where we dive into the tools and the specific tools, um, how they're used or misused. And then, of course, our chapter on uh, resilience. Chapter nine is very interesting because we we try to expose to the reader that these things are actually measurable. That success in these areas are measurable. And you know, we're we're committed to quantification and qualification of things, and we believe that things as strategists, we believe that success can be measured. Uh, there are indicators of effectiveness, uh, et cetera, and we try to expose the reader to some of those. And I'm happy to talk more about these wonderful works of, uh, of political science and, uh, and measurement that various organizations are doing, such as the uh, State Resiliency Index or uh, the Foreign Bilateral Influence um, uh, Index. It, 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 this is really some amazing work that we think is important for statecraft. And then, of course, our final chapter is uh, conclusions. And I'll just, in this last slide, I'll just give you a preview of the conclusions without getting into specifics. And I would say that, you know, the way that we are now framing our conclusion is these first four things. Uh, first of all, reframe. Deliberate action to educate that military power and deterrence is not, should not be kind of leading foreign policy. Uh, that using this framework of irregular warfare and competitive statecraft is actually a better way to look at it. We talk about developing specific strategies for resilience and for the use of Terry statecraft and the use of these elements. And then this uh, third part is where, you know, we get into actually some discussions between the authors about specific reforms to remove what we would call the, the, the per perverse primacy of DOD in, in national security, which is a very hard thing, I'll tell you, from four former army strategists to have to come to grips with the fact that DOD is uh, sort of expanded um, uh, primacy in uh, foreign policy may not be such a good thing. And then of course, measure and monitor where we bring out some of those things from that measurement chapter. But then we say, and then like the, this is sort of a general framework for the strategy for using irregular warfare and strategic competition is first of all, defend, fix our vulnerabilities first. And I'm happy to tell you a few stories about our country's resiliency and their, uh, some of the uh, vulnerabilities to IW, some of which most of you are probably familiar with. But our second one is team up. Um, and it's about collective action with our closest allies and partners. Something which I know this administration has talked a lot about, several administrations have. It's been kind of a common framework in US foreign policy about how closely we work with our allies and partners. But I think you'll find that in our book, we are saying this goes a lot, this kind of teaming up goes a lot farther. And um, we talk about changing the framework from security cooperation to security collaboration um, and getting rid of certain 
restrictions on our ability to actually collaborate with our allies. And then, of course, the final one is fight back, where we talk about offensive IW. So that's a very broad framework. I hope I haven't taken up too much. I really uh, would love to chat with uh, with you, Jeff, and with uh, and with folks here to uh, talk more about the um, about the book and uh, and answer questions. Great, thanks. So I'm going to yeah, stop quick, sharing here. Okay. Yep. There we go. Great. All right, so um, go ahead and use the Q&A block to pop a question in if you've got one. But of course, I've, I've always got uh, the first question just because it's what I do. Uh, a lot of students, and I know I look at the uh, list of attendees, I recognize a lot of uh, both grads and, and current students in the MA and those who have taken 501 from me will recognize uh, the clause with you. My question, and I, because my book was on war narratives and a national will and war, which actually talked about how the U.S. leaders legitimate a, pol a policy of war of some kind, right? So that function uh, is pretty near and dear to my heart. But actually, my question is, do, don't we, as Americans, have kind of a vocabulary problem? Um, it strikes me that, especially because we have a clause with you in view of war, and, and a clause which can do and more demands violence, anything short of violence is just not war. So we have a really hard time comprehending that. And we try to use, we just confuse things because we just don't have the word for it. And I think maybe that's where this, this book actually hits the strongest part because irregular warfare is one idea, that's true. But competitive statecraft might be kind of a suitable fill-in for the fact that we don't have a word for war absent violence, cyber war, information war, political war. That's all, that's not, really resonating with the American public because, well, there's no violence. Nobody's dying. There's nothing to get really emotionally and excited and invested about. Is that where we're yeah. at? We have a vocabulary problem? So I, I, I would uh, absolutely agree with you that we have a, a vocabulary problem. In fact, uh, Jeff Kubiak may be cited in the book. Uh, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if that if that part stays in, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, we uh, there is a vocabulary problem. And Part of that is what we try to cover in this definition section. And that's why we're trying to come up. And that's why, despite the, you know, if, if you read uh, Baldwin's or Zimmering's books on the influence and power, it's mind numbing, right? And Nye's book on soft power, right? Um, we have to kind of come to grips with the fact that somehow these ideas are too complex. And even though uh, I think Nye's uh, reflections of soft power are, are, are valid and well-defined. I don't know that they resonate with the population, right? Mm -hmm. And so somehow uh, our, our, we have a, even though this is directed towards graduate students who are into national security, we hope that the ideas and the way that we've tried to simplify the framing, that the idea of the importance of legitimacy, influence, and power in there, it, it, that this sort of simplification resonates. And we'll recognize that power is great and important, but without influence and legitimacy, when the power goes away, there's no more and, and there's no coercion left. You haven't convinced anyone and there's no belief in that, that it's right. So you actually, you're very fragile. Um, you know, where you think right. you're strong, you're actually just, you know, and this is another word, word thing. You're actually just very robust, right? There's a robustness to power. Uh, but there's also an incredible amount of fragility behind the scenes. Yeah, those are the, me the mechanisms of social control. If you can, you can coerce, you can pay off, or you can be legitimate, right? Those are the kind of the three major mechanisms of social control the literature has. And absent the last one, the first two are really expensive, and you will you, you will very much likely run out of resources before you finish a project. There, one of the questions in the in the uh, at least a comment anyway. It doesn't really put posed as a question, but one of the uh, uh, attendees suggest that this is a change because they think of a regular warfare as low intensity conflict, insurgency, guerrilla warfare, and special forces. And that's really the point, isn't it? This is a change. Yeah. This is something we're trying to expand, open the aperture and expand just a little bit the understanding of what a regular warfare is in order to what match our adversaries or to just understand the contemporary environment. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so uh, you know, having uh, grown up as a as a uh, as a ranger in a green beret, uh, if you had said to me, regular, you know, what's a regular warfare, I would have used those exact uh, phrases. I would have said insurgency, guerrilla warfare, unconventional warfare, support to proxies. I would have said cyber uh, attack. I would have said anything that was as asymmetric 
uh, non-attributable. I would have called those things irregular. Um, and this is why, you know, why as authors, we argued, should we use irregular warfare? Or should we use competitive statecraft? And part of the reason why we chose to keep it a regular warfare was because, um, and, to, and to do both and rather than an either or situation is because within DOD, they recognized that irregular warfare was not just non-attributable or asynchronous actions, but had something to do with the population. And so um, we wanted to expand that framework. So, um, uh, and, and, and to expand and give that broad definition. And quite frankly, Seth Jones, took that definition in his latest book and then to Congress. And we were like, you know what, why don't we, instead of trying to uh, make the wave, why don't we just ride the wave and let's jump on Seth Jones's thing and let's, let, let's kind of advocate for a, a, a little bit of his definition, because I think it, he, he does do a good job of defining it. I hope he footnoted Ryan. Uh, <laughs> we so. did. Of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the, one of the, uh, one of a current mag student asked, uh, Dr. Lemon, well, first of all, she said thank you, but how do you view the relationship between resistance movements and irregular warfare? Resistance movements are sometimes labeled as terrorist groups or insurgents, depending on who is classified in the group. How do you make that distinction, the Taliban, for example? Yeah, so it's a, it, it, it's a great uh, a great question. And I will say in this, in this book, since we are um, um, the U.S. focused, we, we actually do a great deal of uh, we had more, but, you know, we have to cut it down. So, so that part of the resilience chap is about resistance. And so one of the things that the that United States has kind of uh, has had sort of a counterinsurgency focus for a number of reasons for uh, the, the, the prior 20 years. But in the last five to 10 years, um, the United States, and even the Department of Defense, has started to focus on uh, getting back to sort of the Green Beret routes, which uh, looks at resistance as legitimate and when it's legitimate and the support to resistance. And so in our resilience chapters, you know, we make a point that resistance, especially pre-planned and pre-prepared resistance is an important part of resilience. And we've seen this in frontline states. And, you know, part of this I'm, I'm trying to bring in because it's with the, the recently, you know, with, with the Joint Special Operations University, I've done a lot of teaching uh, with friends we've done in Eastern Europe, we've done it for Taiwan, uh, uh, Taiwanese folks, but it's about being ready and prepared to establish a resistance before an invasion happens. And it's actually an effective deterrent but it relies on establishing that sort of resilience framework around a nation, but also like a legal framework to make it legal and legitimate to resist should an invasion happen. You, you have to create, you have to socially construct legitimacy. And you do that by passing a law, by making it clear that it's an obligation of citizenship to resist an invasion. And I, I will tell you that, you know, on all the studies of Ukraine and lessons learned, one of the things that is often overlooked is that in, Ju in July of 2021, so just six, seven months before the, uh, the upscaled invasion, because, you know, technically Ukraine was invaded in 2014, but before the invasion in 2022, about seven months prior, uh, Ukraine passed a national resistance law which explained the obligation and the legalities of fighting back if you're occupied. So those uh, Ukrainian citizens who are now in their occupied territory, they have sort of this legitimacy framework. And I think that law was a lot more important to the national will of Ukraine to resist both militarily, but also to resist as citizens behind enemy lines. And so um, this topic of uh, resistance and insurgency is, is super important. And now in, in just to, just to uh, get at some of the meat of the question though, because resistance movements are sometimes laid, labeled as terrorist groups or insurgents, depending on who's classifying the group. That's exactly right. And that's because legitimacy is so important, right? To make something illegitimate and to convince, to influence a population that something is illegitimate is, is important. That's why, you know, that's, uh, that's why res certain resistance groups are called terrorist groups. Now, I like to think there's a specific definition of terrorist. Um, and, and, you know, my definition has to do with 
the deliberate targeting of civilians makes you a terrorist, but it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter to uh, to uh, somebody who's trying to fight against this, uh, an insurgent group or a resistance group. Labeling them as terrorists is important to take away and erode their legitimacy. That's why this framework is so important. Sorry if that's a long answer, but but it's yeah, a really no, good question, a, Zeno. Yeah, it does, and it focuses on the concept of legitimacy is oftentimes not discussed in a lot of these settings, partially because it's kind of hard to understand. It's it's a it's a fairly I don't want to say squishy. It's kind of a, that's a, a non academic term, but uh, it, it is it is something uh, a little bit harder to get your arms around, and it certainly is difficult to measure in any any uh, in anywhere. Else. Doesn't mean it's not possible to measure. It's just really difficult to measure. I'll let some of the other attendees get their questions asked here. So one of the attendees asked, is, um, Dr. Glemmon, you expressed some concern that the Department of Defense exercises too much influence in shaping national security policy, but the Biden team has made absolutely clear that diplomacy leads the way. And more and more, it appears that Secretary Austin has been put on the sidelines in favor of Secretary Blinken. How much more would you like to see the DOD step back? Yeah, uh, so th that's a great question, and I would give kudos to the Biden administration for that, and also to uh, Secretary Austin because um, I, 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 have, I have reason to believe he uh, in, in this area. So it's it's um, I think that's great. And so what I would say though is that because of the size, power, and budget of DOD. It has momentum. It has a tendency. And, you know, we happen to have a president right now, and this is not a, a partisan comment or anything else, but he's he's been around the block more than once. Um, and he was also chairman of the uh, uh, of the, uh, f uh, you know, Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate. So he had he has an understanding of what the Department of State needs to do, what it can do if uh, if, if done correctly. I'm not sure that every presidential administration has that. And so part of our book is like, what can we do structurally to take away some of that gravity and some of that momentum? Um, but but I would say that, you know, I would I, I would criticize the Biden administration on certain things, but I would actually praise them, uh, praise uh, the, the president on, on giving uh, the Secretary of State some level of lead in, in making and shaping policy. I actually think it has done wonders for U.S. legitimacy, um, not so much in other areas, but 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 this is where where, where that's important. And so the, the the question, one of the questions I will say that we are we were grappling with in our recommendation section is how bold to be in recommendations, especially if you want to recommend structural change. Because on the one hand, you can be bold and you can be pie in the sky, but on the other hand, how much should your recommendations be the art of the possible? major restructuring of the US government is not likely when you know you can barely even elect a speaker right <laughs> and so and so if we if, if we make pie in the sky recommendations about how how to restructure uh the 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 government we risk kind of being like oh you know it, it, that's that's rainbows and unicorns thank you for that but then again yeah. if you're not bold if you're just going to be you know what you think's in the art of possible you know you, we may be recommending things that won't make any difference at all well uh, Lawrence Friedman, one of my favorite writers on strategy, would tell you that strategy starts here in the present, in, the, in your current situation. You can have aspirations mm -hmm. and you can look to see the future that you want, you desire, but it's got to start right here. And I think that that will trouble you in generating anything that that looks uh, looks productive and bold because it's going to be trouble. It's just going to be troubling, as you commented. Um, uh, and speaking of the government, uh, one of the other uh, attendees says, I'm reading a lot today about trust. Trusting government, trusting government agencies, et cetera, et cetera. How does this enter into your thinking? Where does trust fit? Yeah, so a, a, a great deal uh, into uh, into um, into our thinking uh, about this, and we, I think we uh, we touch on it mostly in the information section, uh, in the information chapter, and in the resilience chapter about trust in government. Um, we cite quite a bit of what I think is excellent work from the Rand Corporation about what's known as truth decay. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to phrase uh, kind of a, a problem in modern society. And we, we discussed um, some of the aspects of why that is and why trust uh, is, is necessary. So trust is essential for resilience and it's essential for uh, combating um, uh, uh, disinformation and misinformation. 
And so, you know, build that up. Well, there's a lot of ways to uh, to go about building that up. And we, we, we actually start with some recommendations about uh, journalism and how journalism is done. Um, we highlight some of the great work that's already been done on countering uh, disinformation and misinformation, some of the examples uh, such as in Latvia and Estonia, uh, for how to count, uh, and some of the work uh, even ASU is doing, uh, you know, with uh, groups like PolitiFact, et cetera, trying to establish and reestablish truth and trust. Um, uh, and also some of the great work that, uh, you know, actually corporations are doing some amazing work right now. You know, everybody's afraid of, of, uh, of um, you know, digital uh, fakes and deep fakes and, and whatnot, but you have companies like Adobe and, um, other uh, companies working together on the provenance project, uh, building software where if a picture taken with a camera is edited in any way, you know, there's a, there's a digital log or blockchain. So somebody can look immediately and say, okay, I know this picture has been altered. You know, I know this is not real. This is, it doesn't have a real signature on it. And so some of this work that's coming out to actually build this trust to combat truth decay, we tried to get, a um, a broad survey of those efforts because I tell you what if you try to survey this there's a lot of writing out there about about truth decay about how hopeless it is about misinformation but but when you want to actually look at the efforts to counter that stuff you actually have to look a little bit harder but there is some really impressive efforts about what are uh, emerging as best practices or good practices to help uh, rebuild and reestablish trust. And so it's a hugely important part of the, the book. And one, again, you know, um, I hope we do justice to, uh, given our word count, given how much we're supposed to, how much we're trying to say in this book. Yeah. I mean, obviously the relationship between trust and, and legitimacy is, is, it's inseparable. I mean, they, they don't necessarily overlap hundred percent, but they certainly overlap a significant amount. Um, another question from an audience member, um, uh, one of the current MAG students, many in the foreign policy arena have stated that the United States lags China and Russia in unconventional warfare, or uh, maybe I think here irregular warfare. What is the possible cause? Could we attribute that to the U.S. over-reliance on the powerful military in the kinetic situation that I call it the $800, $800 billion gorilla in the room? <laughs> That's right. Yes. And so, Bob. But my answer would be a, a, a kind of a big yes, uh, that a lot of that we do attribute uh, to exactly that. Um, but we also attribute it a bit to those other elements of strategic culture. You know, this uh, dichotomy between war and peace. It is not just, you know, we call it American strategic culture, but we also point out that it's not just an American thing. It, it's a bit exa exacerbated by our history and, and, our, and our relative uh, isolation that when it was time to go to war, it was time to go to war. And war was, a, you know, despite the fact, as, as you know, Jeff, that, you know, we, we ended up fighting small wars or regular warfares during times of so-called peace. But we really look at it as a dichotomy between war and peace. And so when it's war, it's time to go all out. But to, to be fair, we also state that, you know, the, that the literature on this and international relations and political science shows us that it's not just a U.S. thing. This is a democracy thing. A lot of democracies tend to be really good at fighting, fighting, you know, uh, deeply existential conventional wars. You know, you mess with a with, with a with a mature democracy in a situation where it's going to rise to the level of a high level of warfare, and you're probably going to lose. Um, you know, that's that's empirical, right? <laughs> Um, and, and, and so maybe that has something to do with it as well. I, I would also say that there is a bit of distaste, right, in, in the idea that in democracy that somehow war or violence uh, would enter the role uh, the realm of politics. While we might say and, and know and understand from Clausewitz the connection between, or think we know and understand the connection be, between the two, our civil military relations makes us not very comfortable in dealing with uh, – uh, dealing with the political side of things, especially when that gets into armed politics. Back to, I mean, you, you raise a point, and I'll, I'll come back to it maybe in a different discussion, but you don't have a chapter in there really or, or, or at all that I saw on the, the Civ Mill dialogue, the Clausewitzian Civ Mill dialogue, right? And, and that, mm -hmm. to me, oftentimes serves as a critical juncture that is, that is where failure can be located in most situations where we lose the peace. Uh, so we'll come we'll come back to that because there's another good question in the in the um, question and answer block I wanted to get to. Um, 
and it kind of goes back to this discussion about who's in the lead state, you know, uh, DOD, whoever it says in your mind, who should be responsible for crafting and overseeing the implementation of irregular warfare competitive statecraft campaign plans. DOS, National Security Advisor, a new office, you know, you, you, you clearly didn't want DOD in the lead. So where does it go? And, and now we're back into the realm of the possible. Are we doing a massive government reorg? Um, how do we, how do we in the short term take a, you know, the first bite of this elephant? Yeah, and it's a, and it's a great question, and uh, you know, um, I just lost the name of the individual that uh, asked that question, but uh, um, it was, uh, uh, I think maybe it was Bruce. Yeah, so uh, yeah. so Bruce uh, Bruce is probably welcome to join the author team as we've argued about this uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, uh, or, or d discuss this quite a bit. Um, clearly, th this does need to come from the top. But if we had to pick a prime, pick a level of prime, I, I think we would pick the Department of State on this. Um, or if we could pick the rainbows and unicorn pie in the sky of a general restructuring, you know, there are odd ways of conceiving of this. And 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 uh, being you know president of the, of the national uh, of the uh, uh, Army Strategists Association, I get sort of these reflections from various Army strategists that work across DOD and work in the interagency and uh, more army strategists actually work on the National Security Council, I believe, than any other MOS. And so I sometimes get reflections from uh, those who have, have worked there. And, you know, they, they, as they think about the interagency and what, you know, a, a, a reorg might look like, um, one of the boldest I've ever heard or thought about was that, you know, the... Uh, if you take the Department of Defense and you make it solely a force provider, and it provides forces to a, uh, a State Department, actually a broadened State Department, but it's the Department of Foreign Affairs that actually leverages, you know, and, and, and that part of the Department of Defense that is regional combatant commands actually becomes part of a unified foreign policy led by a Department of State sort of uber ambassadors you begin to have sort of a, a, a better structure, if you will, for a, sort of a Department of State Foreign Affairs Administration that that that, that leads stuff. And you have a, a diplomatic corps, which actually provides uh, leadership and diplomats to a Department of Foreign Affairs. So that's like a huge restructuring, which, you know, we were actually started examining laws and trying to figure out how, like how would you restructure and i mean just kind of the legal framework to restructure that it would involve restructuring congress it would involve you know and, and so then you start getting into wait a minute that would be much better and much smarter but it's almost it, it, but, but politically it doesn't enter the realm of, it seems to fall out of the realm of the possible because you have mm -hmm. to change congressional committees you have to uh, change the law in one case that we we looked at, you may even have to change it part of the Constitution. I mean, so this gets like, it gets, uh, so if I am in the sky, perfect world, um, I actually might pursue something like that. In terms of the reality, a president has to empower that sort of national security uh, advisor to, uh, as a convening authority, but has to give some level of primacy to the Department of State. And the Department of State needs a little bit more capacity in terms of uh, in terms of the who and the what and the and the, and the where of the the actual bureaucracy and what it can do. You mean the State Department needs more people than the U.S. Army Band has? Is that the yes? The... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I love that one. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, the insanity of the uh, of the of just the size of the Department of Defense. Um, I, I would like to say that we put some of that in this book, but uh, we left very little of it. But if you do want to read about it, you can read Sue's other Sue and Mark's other book about the uh, about you know funding the national security establishment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right, try to get try to get to more uh, more uh, attendee questions here. So not to spoil the book, but can you give us some insight on your recommendations for changing American strategic culture to better combat the Chinese? And this is a good question because another question in here, um, uh, it's like a part part two of a question I didn't get to before Zaina. Sorry, uh, does cognitive warfare count as a regular warfare? And so those are those are kind of related questions. And actually, Bob Schmidl, I know you know um, uh, General Schmidl, is is actually on a study group doing some work on, on Chinese cognitive warfare. So those things all link together in my in my estimation. And so, what are the recommendations there? You know, and it kind of goes into this concept of resilience, I suppose that you that you discuss. 
Yeah, and we, in, in part it does go into resilience and, uh, and uh, on the part of uh, cognitive warfare. Cognitive warfare and narrative warfare, we try to include in the information uh, statecraft space, but emphasizing, you know, that um, uh, the, the cognitive warfare, the, the way that it's normally conceived is a bit more targeted uh, to key in individuals, whereas the you know, narrative warfare is really about the that greater population. But both are incredibly important. It's one thing to have uh, provenance, to have uh, combat truth decay, but the, the fact of the matter is humans interpret information and narratives etc they interpret stories differently right so so they have to be uh they have to be targeted so these are definitely um uh, part of the construction the first part of that question was like how do you change this culture and i i will say that um you know this is something that we are uh struggling with but i think the first you know and, and any good uh, authors uh you know the first thing is read our book right okay great yeah obviously but 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 I, I think that we we are kind of focused on educating for simplicity and taking away some of the uh, power and authority of the Department of Defense, which isn't radical. It's in alignment with what almost every Secretary of Defense has said, you know, uh, you know, and perhaps best and most most bluntly from Jim Mattis, who said, you know, if you don't spend more on the Department of State, uh, you know, you might as well buy me more bullets. Right. And, and so it, it kind of begins, uh, uh, begins with that. But I will tell you, we are still struggling with getting some, getting to that really concrete, like, okay, you know, how do you reframe and reeducate? What specifically can we do? Give me a smart objective on this. Right. That's a bit challenging, uh, but but we but we do have some drafted, and so and I, and I will tell you they are along those lines. Super good. Um, this is a good question because it kind of it actually a, a little bit um, integrates this idea of the difference between the regular warfare and conventional or or, or or real warfare. And it says I think your book seems to focus on strategies to prevent conflict, or in 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 most cases at least outside of conflict. But do you address strategies once war has begun between the parties? In other words. In my mind, what does competitive statecraft or regular warfare look like during um, a, a war, a conventional war? Mm -hmm. or a yeah, and I think it's more like that. I, 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 I would tell Jay that the answer is no, uh, because at some point we had to decide our book was about what it was not about. And so um, and, and so if there is, uh, you know, something missing that begs a question, it is that. And uh, and and maybe that's a good sequel book to it. But uh, but but I, I I think that if we, and in fact I think I actually went down this road a little bit on our resist on that question on resistance went down that road a little bit on irregular warfare in a resistance environment, and we kind of had to pull it out and say the book is not about that. It's about preparing for that, you know, a, a preparation for that and using that as a, as a deterrent. So uh, in writing any book, a, a point comes where you have to decide what the book isn't about as much as what it is about, right? And so, uh, so, so, so no, I think that's something, but I think that's an important topic. Really good. Well, we're at an hour. I promise all the faculty when we do these kind of events that we keep it to an hour. Uh, we appreciate your time a lot, Ken. It was a really great conversation. The, obviously, there's a, there's, there was so much more to say and so many more ideas to explore on this topic. Um, when the book comes out, hopefully when spring 24, so January, February ish, I'm optimist that spring starts in January. Um, so yeah, okay. We're looking, we're looking for the book. I know there are a lot of mag students in that, in the attendee list that, uh, will probably go, well, I could, I probably know some of that stuff, or that would be interesting based upon my previous studies. So I, I, I think the book would fit right into the curriculum here as well. And then my global security. Thanks again for your time. Thanks for joining us, everyone who came and, uh, we'll hope to see you again in a future event.